Hey, good morning, everybody. Here we are. <laughs> Once again, uh, variety. <laughs> Things always seem to be different every week. Uh, thanks for your flexibility. I sure hope that uh, nobody showed up today on site because I was, obviously we're not uh, meeting in person. After uh, this morning got up, as you all know, the air quality was terrible. It's very hot. If you guys had come, those of you who show up, you would have also seen that it's actually probably a good idea that we're not um, meeting at this time because uh, the Adventists are actually doing all this. They're building sheds over there. It's kind of surreal. I keep looking that way because I can look out my window and see what's going on. There's like, there's like literally like a hundred sheds out there on the property. They're building these to give away, I think, to campfire victims or something like that. Anyway, so it's kind of nutty over there anyway. So it's a good thing that we're uh, here online. We get to be able to do this. That's great. Um, we can connect this way. A quick uh, shout out to uh, Tracy Eiler. Happy birthday to you. Um, I think you're away from town, but if you're tuning in or watching this later, happy birthday. Yay. Uh, uh, quickly, before I turn it over to our time of, of worship, um, I also wanted to mention that uh, I did send out an email this week. Uh, we sent out an email this week. Pretty important one. It has a couple of uh, items on it. It's got the monthly financial statement like we always send out. It also has the decision made about um, the pastor's salaries. That decision got made, and I wrote up, you know, about how, uh, how that all turned out. Basically, it got approved. Um, and I just wanted to say on that note, uh, speaking for all four of us, thank you guys so much. Uh, we're so thankful for the team that uh, did the work of figuring out, coming up with a recommendation, and then uh, all of you, um, I, I think most of all, there's just sort of an affirmation behind all of that from all of you uh, to us um, to be your pastors. And we really appreciate that. To us, it's a great privilege that we get to um, uh, serve you in this way and give our lives to this ministry. So thank you for that. There's also an item in there about uh, the possibility of partnering with some missionaries. It's something we can't talk about online because it's sort of a secure, it's a security uh, issue with where they're serving. So that's all I'm going to say. All of that, if you didn't get the email, if you don't know what I'm talking about, please contact me and I will make sure you get that. Okay? I think that is everything. And now I'm going to uh, turn this over um, to Megan uh, to for our call to worship. Hi everyone, um, my name is Megan uh, Klein. I am Connor's wife. He spoke a few weeks ago. Um, I'm going to be doing the call to worship today. Um, so uh, I've been thinking a lot about uh, what I wanted to say today and um, I was thinking that this is a very fitting message for today. Um, and a lot of you will probably be able to relate to this, but um, lately I have been struggling a lot with PTSD with all the smoke in the air, all of the fires all around us. It's, it's, it's hard stuff and it's not easy. Um, and then on top of that, the stress of COVID and just adjusting to, you know, going back to school and like, you know, people are working from home. It's just a really stressful, weird time um, in everybody's lives right now. Um, this has left me wondering um, what God is doing right now um, and what he wants me to do in this situation. Because in these big situations, there's fires everywhere. There's, you know, COVID. Like, that's things you can't control. And just for me, I, I feel helpless. And, like, what do, you, what do you want me to do? What do you need me to do? Um, when life does get hard and, these, and, and things are really confusing, the questions that come to my mind... Are the, those why questions, the um, why is this happening, why why are you putting us through this? I know there's a better way to say that, but um, anyway, so I've been reading in Habakkuk lately, and the <laughs> I realize God answers these questions in a very uh, unique way. So um, I'm going to be reading from Habakkuk 1 verses 2 through 5 today. So, <clears throat> how long, O oh Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? 
Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. Here is the Lord's answer. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed, for I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. Reading this was very comforting to me because it made me realize that I am not the only person that feels this way, and I certainly will not be the last. Habakkuk came to God with all of these questions, and the way that he answered him is the way that he answers us today. <clears throat> we are not always able to understand what is happening, um, and which is why that we need to trust in our God who does understand what he's doing and promises that he is still at work. Um, as we enter into this time of worship, um, I encourage everyone to humble ourselves before God, to take our eyes off of all of the pain and stress in this world right now, and to focus our eyes on him. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. Um, Jen and I, most Jen is gonna lead us on this morning. Um, we are talking today about humility and God's character of selflessness. So we're going to be singing a familiar song, Reckless Love, but we're changing the word reckless to selfless so that we can focus in on that character trait of our Father.
Good morning. Thank you, Jenna. That was awesome. Super proud of you. Thanks, Beck. And thank you, Megan, also for what you shared this morning. Um, boy, yeah, what Megan was sharing from Habakkuk. Um, I had no idea what she was going to share on. Um, and uh, that really hit home because I know for a lot of us, uh, these, uh, these why questions, you know, we've got this conception as, as believers that we should always have faith and that we should always trust and that when we start having uh, these questions about why coming up in our souls, we, we tend to stuff those. And we're like, I shouldn't be thinking this way. I shouldn't be thinking this way. But just to be able to look back in history and see so many godly people raise these why questions with God and have it be okay. Um, I think that's a, that's an amazing thing. Like we have to give ourselves permission to be able to ask God hard questions and know that God can handle it. Um, so today, um, I just encourage you if you're in a place where, um, you need to ask God some hard questions of why is this happening or why are you doing this to me? That that's actually okay. God can handle it. Um, today, uh, this is our final look at First Peter, and uh, Peter is going to be uh, closing his letter to those dispersed throughout Asia Minor, and he's talk, been talking about some heavy themes, themes that we've looked at over the past couple months. He's talked about uh, submission and humility all through this letter, and he's actually going to close it uh, the same way. It's like he can't reiterate enough how important humility is in the life of a believer, that we imitate the humility of Christ. So this is 1 Peter 5, uh, verses 5 through 11. So if you've got a Bible or you need to run and grab a Bible, I encourage you to do so uh, right now, and I'm going to read that. Chapter 5, verse 5. Peter writes this, Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. When I first read uh, this passage in preparation uh, for this series, I thought Peter was doing this kind of last-minute shotgun approach at the end of his letter, like there were a whole bunch of random thoughts in his mind he wanted to communicate to the churches dispersed throughout Asia Minor. Um, but I'm, upon closer inspection, he's actually ending with this plea for believers to live in a lifestyle of humility, being humble, in submission to God and to each other. And everything he says after sort of fleshes out this idea of humility. So first he says, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. Humble yourselves. Some friends and I were reading this post uh, or this past week, out of uh, Paul's letter to Timothy. And uh, Paul had said, in the last days, you will see a lot of arrogant people, people who are proud, people having all the answers, people saying, my way is the right way. Uh, pride and humility have always battled in people's hearts for prominence. And it says, in fact, God resists the proud. And this word resist in the Greek is an image of a warrior in battle array. He's got armor and sword and shield at the ready to fight. Humility is demonstrated by submission. It is the ability to cheerfully put away our own agenda for God's agenda, even if God's agenda is going to look different than what we might want or how we would do it. And the phrase, be clothed in humility, be clothed, translates a word that refers to a slave putting on an apron before serving, just like Jesus did when he put on a towel to wash the disciples' feet in John 13. So I want to pose a question this morning to our North State Church family. Are we ready and willing 
to embrace a posture of humility before God and before man. Now, we would like jump at the chance to say, of, of course, you know, or we think so. But before we answer that, listen to this quote from good old Oswald Chambers, who wrote My Utmost for His Highest. He wrote this about humility. Are you willing to be offered to be poured out as a sacrifice for others? Or do you say, I'm not going to be offered up just yet. I do not want God to choose my work. I want to choose the scenery of my own sacrifice. I want to have the right kind of people watching and saying, well done. It is one thing to go out on the lonely way of dignified heroism, but quite another thing if the line mapped out for you by God means to be a doormat under people's feet. Suppose God wants to teach you to say, I know how to be humiliated. Are you ready to be offered up like that? Are you ready to be not so much as a drop in the bucket to be so hopelessly insignificant that you are never thought of again in connection with the life you served? Are you willing to spend and be spent, not seeking to be ministered unto, but to minister? Some saints cannot do this and remain saints because it is beneath their dignity. Wow. So let me ask this again. Will we as a church family embrace a lifestyle of humility before God and before man. If that is what it will look like, if that might be the, de the definition. To choose the path of humility is the path that no one will see what we do. No praise or accolades from others. So in all these things that follow in Peter's letter, feed into this idea of clothing oneself with humility. So he writes this, cast all your care upon him. True humility is shown by our ability to cast our cares and our worries upon God. Do you know that worry is one of the greatest examples of pride in our life? Worry is this, our desire to have control and to fix something. Worry is our thoughts about something not going the way we want it to go or expect it to go. It's a proud presumption to take things into our own hands and our own care that God has promised to take care of in his own timing. There's this promise in verse 6, Peter says, that when we truly humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, we would actually have far fewer cares that would need to be cast upon him. Casting is a rather energetic word. He's not saying gently lay this at the feet of Christ. He's saying Throw it away from you frantically as if your life depended upon it. The pressures and the burdens of our life are so heavy and difficult that it takes a great concentration for us to even turn our gaze to be fixated upon Jesus again. What are the things we haven't cast upon God? Maybe thoughts like this. I'm worried my finances over the next six months might not be quite enough. I am burdened that others seem to enjoy life more than me. I am worried that I may dwindle into obscurity and people won't notice me. I am burdened that I cannot get revenge on those who wronged me, or worse, that God might be merciful to those who have hurt me. I am worried that the season of life will never end. Do we really trust God to handle those things I just mentioned? Or will pride speak out and demand that we try to control our destiny and our future and we will worry about it until it happens? So Peter goes on to say this, Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him. When I was 17 years old, had a birthday party, a sleepover in the mountains of Shingletown, and I invited a whole bunch of my uh, friends over, and we, uh, late at night, we hooked up a couple extension cords out kind of into the woods, and we set up a TV where our sleeping bags uh, were under the stars. And uh, we showed this movie, and I'm 17 years old, we showed them, uh, a lot of my friends who were younger than me, this R-rated movie called The Ghost and the Darkness. And it's a true story about these two lions in Africa uh, back about 150 years ago, in this town called Sabo, these two lions go and they start mauling hundreds of people. 
um, kind of a freak event, and uh, this hunter is trying to, to hunt the lion, starring Val Kilmer and Michael Douglas. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. It will, I, well, probably won't change your life, but it's a fun <laughs> flick. Anyway, we show this movie to my friends, and, uh, you know, we're all terrified. There's blood, and there's gore, and these lions are uh, killing people. You know, it's just fantastic uh, viewing pleasure for a 17-year-old. Anyway, we turn the TV off. It's like midnight. We're lying. We're trying to go to sleep. And uh, I'm in the middle of my buddies, and uh, people start dropping off. Some kids are snoring. And then I hear, in the distance, in the mountains, this sound. Wow! <laughs> Like that. And I'm quiet. My heart starts racing. We hear it again. Whew! And a friend of mine says, Caleb. His name was Luke. And I said, yeah, I hear it. And he says, what is that? And I said, it's a mountain lion. Now, we had just watched a movie about mountain lion or lions, excuse me, in Africa, mauling hundreds of people. And so Luke says to me, it's like, what do we do? And I whisper back to him, well, we're in the middle of the group, so if anything happens, the lion's gonna eat the ones on the end first. Just don't move. <laughs> and he said, okay. So we waited, and uh, probably an hour later, the, the voice died off as it was hunting uh, through the woods at night. Needless to say, we didn't get much sleep that night. Um, but the, the point is this. You don't sleep when a lion is prowling nearby. And Peter means the same thing when he's saying, the, the enemy, your devil, he is prowling, and I want you to be sober and be vigilant, be watchful. Resist the devil, your adversary. The same verb that's used when God resists the proud, he says we are to resist the adversary of our souls in the same way. Battle array at ready. So how does clothing ourselves with humility, play into this. He tells us to be sober and be vigilant. And he's not talking about be sober like drinking wine here. He's talking about not getting distracted by the world under the influence of its confusion created by the adversary. Pride says this, I can veg in my Christian life. I can sleep. I don't have to be vigilant. My prayer life might be non-existent, but that's okay because I'm going to heaven anyway. I can pick up my Bible once a week because, you know, I know it pretty well already. I might not have been in community this last week as much as I should, but hey, we're busy and COVID makes it hard. So the adversary keeps sowing confusion into people's minds. He's sowing discord. Look at the world, the competing powers, the rise and fall of empires, families broken, distrust everywhere. And it's easy to get caught up in this world system that is not the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, there is peace, there is joy in the middle of turmoil. If we're not experiencing the peace of God right now, then we are potentially walking outside of the kingdom of peace that Christ promised us and that Christ wants us to walk in. Peter says, be clear-headed, be sober, be vigilant, be in prayer, pray without ceasing, be invested in the Word of God. Let the Word of God be the voice that is speaking to your soul instead of the cacophony of competing voices that are speaking in the world today. He says, be in community, don't veg during the season, stay sober, be vigilant. Humility says, I need this, I need these things, I need these people Pride says, we'll be fine in isolation. We can do this on our own. Humility recognizes our need to be awake and alert. And our need for the word of God and our need for the people of God to be present with us. Then Peter writes in verse 10, there will be the promise of suffering. Somewhere along the way, we believe this lie that if I have Christ, I will not suffer. But over and over, the gospel of Christ says that we must suffer with him. Deny ourselves daily. In fact, we're to pick up our own cross as a lifestyle. Jesus said in John 16, In this world, you will have trouble. You will suffer. But in the middle of that, take heart. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. 
To be humble is to accept suffering and see this as the way of the cross. We demonstrate the glory of God by how we handle suffering. Then Peter ends with this promise of restoration. After you have suffered a little while, Christ himself will restore you, confirm you, strengthen you, and establish you. I want to look at these four things. The first, restore. When God begins to build something in our lives, he rarely starts from scratch. Often what God prefers to do is to take something that's already broken and to fix it and build upon it. This is how God worked through Nehemiah in the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. He didn't tell Nehemiah to remove the old burnt walls and simply start over. He told him to build them up from the rubble. And I know in my life, just personally, I want God to work by replacement. I want him to remove all the broken situations, my faulty thinking patterns, and to make me an entirely brand new person. But God instead chooses to restore broken people. When we remember this about God, it actually changes the way we think about other people. It changes the way we pray. The very thing we're asking God to remove from our life actually winds up being the building blocks of a new foundation. The second is this, to confirm. This is the voice of God saying, you belong. You are one of my people. And there is real power in knowing you belong. This is something God does for us. He gives us this sense of belonging. Over and over, I've heard throughout this isolation period, uh, this quarantine period during COVID, that people feel isolated. And because they feel isolated, they feel like they don't belong, whether it's either to like a specific, you know, group or whether it's like to the family of God. Um, what isolation does from us is, is it uh, eats away, it wears away at our sense of belonging. And when God confirms us, it's his reminder that he's saying, you know what, I am right with you, and so is the community of saints. You have belonging. You are part of a family. There is something bigger going on here, and I want you to feel a part. God says that during the season of isolation, he will confirm us. He will speak to our souls that, that necessary need we have of feeling like we belong to something greater than ourselves. And the third is this, strengthening. Um, the Christian walk is not this like slow buildup to becoming a superhero. It's steadily growing in our ability to let God strengthen us in our weakness. It's not relying on our own strength or our own wisdom. And many of us in this season can attest to the fact that we have very little strength left. We are exhausted, we are tired, we are broken. And it's God we rely on, not ourselves trying to muster up enough strength to feel better. The more we try to do it and control it our own way, the weaker we end up feeling. So it's instead turning towards God and saying, God, I need you to strengthen me in this weakness. And the fourth is this, established. And this is that feeling of being settled. I would guess that most of us, feel like in some way that we're in some sort of transition. We're not settled yet. Being more secure is right around the corner. I tell myself, after we buy a house, then I will feel more settled. <laughs> when that job placement happens, then I will feel more secure. When the kids move out, then life will open up. When this COVID season ends, then life will get back to normal. But the truth is, Life is transition. And all these things I just mentioned will not settle us. Our heart is settled when we understand and live in the fact that God alone is our home and our security. God's presence with us is that which establishes us. And that's hard because when we're in the middle of transition, when we feel like change is right around the corner, we put our hope in that. When that happens to us, then I will feel settled. Then I will feel secure. But we've got to recognize that that will never happen. Life is always going to be some sort of change and transition. And it's the presence of God with us that we grab onto and say, this is what establishes us. 
So these four words that God will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish, taken together, begin to paint a picture of a God who is for us, a God who is not this crazy, demanding taskmaster asking us to reach a certain level of holiness, holiness before he uh, accepts us. But he's rather a loving father who is restoring us. He's giving a sense of belonging. He's strengthening us when we feel powerless. He's establishing us, being settled. He is our peace and security in this world of change. And Peter closes his letter with this phrase in verse 11. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. All control is his. In the middle of the crazy, in the middle of the frustration, and in the middle of the isolation, in the middle of the hurting and the anxiety, in the middle of nations and political parties and empires at war, Christ has dominion and authority. And we must relinquish that to him. Our grasping for control, our worry, our desire to have things go the way we want, we must let it go. And that is the ultimate act of humility. Pride holds on to control. In humility, a person is able to release that to God. So Peter ends this letter encouraging believers to embrace this as a lifestyle. So let me pose that question I asked at the beginning again today. Are we ready and willing to embrace this lifestyle and posture as a North State family? To have a posture of humility in our interactions with God and people knowing what it will cost us. To close, um, years ago, I was introduced uh, to a prayer. And this prayer was called the Litany of Humility. And it was written by a monk about 120 years ago. And uh, this monk uh, kind of rose through the ranks uh, in the church and ended up becoming a, a cardinal. But he always looked back on his uh, monkhood <laughs> sort of years, and this prayer he developed as a way of keeping at bay pride within himself, but also keeping humility as his perspective in life. And the first time I really heard this prayer, it was, um, to put it blunt, uh, it was a butt kicker for me, um, because there were so many phrases in this that I read, and it really stung my soul, and it really stung my pride, and it really challenged my way of thinking. And I just thought, for us, closing this book of 1 Peter, as Peter is calling believers to live in a life of humility, I thought, you know, it'd be good for us to just spend a little bit reflecting, a little bit challenging our own souls to adopt this posture, to adopt this lifestyle, and have some really challenging words spoken over us and uh, prayed um, over us. So I'm going to pray this slowly. Um, are we gonna, we're gonna have the words up on uh, your screen as well so that you can read and reflect along. But I would just encourage you with an open heart and an open mind as I pray slowly these words that were written uh, over a hundred years ago. Uh, just these words of, of um, relinquishment and, and letting go that you would let the Spirit of God speak to your soul, and through this letting go, you would experience the, the strengthening, the confirming, the establishing of God. O oh Jesus, meek and humble of heart, hear me. From the desire of being esteemed, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being honored, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being praised, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being preferred, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being consulted, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being approved, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being humiliated, deliver me, Jesus. 
from the fear of being despised. Deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being forgotten. Deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being wronged. Deliver me, Jesus. That others may be loved more than I, Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be esteemed more than I, Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That in the opinion of the world, others may increase and I may decrease. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. O Jesus, meek and humble of heart, Make me like unto thee. Let's continue to pray. Jesus, we seek to imitate your humility. The way you poured yourself out, the way you became nothing and despised by all men, without thanks, without gratitude, without the applause of thousands. You made yourself nothing and you took on the lowliest form. And God, we recognize in our own hearts our desire to be consulted and preferred, our fears of dwindling into obscurity, our fears of being forgotten. We want others to consult us. We want our opinion known. Especially in, in this day and age where so many voices are competing for attention. We want to add our voice to the mix. Feeling like our voice could change the world when what the world really needs is not another voice, but yours. The world needs your voice and not ours. Allow us to become less so that you may become greater. Allow us as a church that when people think of North State, they think of a church that is clothed in humility, a church that represents Christ and the gospel, which is walking the way of the cross, denying ourselves and thinking of others as more highly and more important than ourselves. Help us to adopt that attitude, that posture, and that lifestyle. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us with an unconditional love. We can't earn it, nor do we try to. We just accept it, and we thank you this morning. Thank you that we can be a part of your family. In Jesus, in your name, we pray these things. Amen. We're going to close with our doxology, and then uh, we're going to have a little in-person roundtable discussion afterward. So stay tuned. Bella's going to help us. Thank you, guys. All right. This is uh, the fireside chat. This is the living room session. <laughs> Actually taking place in a living room this time. We're up at Dave and LaShawn's. Okay. Here I go. Do <laughs> <laughs> I sit in the big chair? You can have whatever chair you want. This is good. This is good. Okay. Thank you guys for being here with us today. Hey! Yeah! Yay! Yay! Look at this. Yeah. I think we're all in. <laughs> so it's interesting. Actually, um, we met with a, a friend uh, earlier this week, and she was talking about 
I'm just going to keep moving. He was talking about this whole, um, like, I feel like when I humble myself, and she didn't even know what I was preaching on. She said, well, I feel like when I humble myself in front of my friends, like, I'm just taken advantage of. And um, I thought one of the things that would be really good for us to talk about is this idea of being a doormat under people's feet. And the idea of sometimes when I adopt like a Christ-like attitude, people do take advantage of me. Like, what, what do we do? Like, obviously, there's a couple different scenarios and there's a couple different ways uh, we could go with that. But just initial responses when, when people talk about humility, one of the things is they say, I don't want to be taken advantage of. Therefore, I must assert myself. I must stand up for myself. What are your thoughts about, about that? When I saw it, a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about that quote um, about being a doormat with less than a drop in the bucket. And I, that doormat word is kind of bad connotations today because it's like being taken advantage of. But I think that our attitude toward humility is um, taking the attention off of ourselves. So if we are like lowering ourselves so that other people will like us. That's not the kind of doormat humility that Jesus is asking of us. He's asking us to love other people and humble ourselves for the benefit of others. Hmm. Sort of the purpose? The purpose of it, yeah. What if people are like um, like abusing you yeah. in, in a certain way? Maybe not, I mean, not physically, um, although that could apply. But, I mean, we've got Jesus saying... Like, if someone strikes you on the cheek, you turn in the other one. If someone actually steals from you uh, a garment, give them another garment as well. Uh, do not resist an evil person. How do we handle, like, a saying like that? I mean, I, I think, um, when I think about it, I think that there's kind of going on what Becky said. I think um, it's about, it's about, you mentioned the word control earlier. Um but being self-controlled, not trying to be in control of the world, but when Jesus is the ultimate doormat, uh, you know, he gets crucified, there's that strong sense in which he's a, he chose it. You know, that when the soldiers come to get him, I love the scene in John where he, who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth, I am he, and they all hit the ground, you know, like he kind of shows them and he says to Pilate, you don't have any power over me. Unless it, you know, there's the sense in which he, he has chosen to hand himself over. And I know for myself, like when I'm people-pleasing or, I, or, I, or I'm codependent and someone's taking advantage of me, it's because something else is driving me. Something that's less than good, less than healthy. And I'm letting them take advantage of me because of a lower purpose. And that's different than me being very self-possessed, knowing that um, a person has a need or, or perhaps someone is being evil or whatever, and choosing for the right reason, back to what, what Becky said, like for a reason that's not self-serving, that's not all these other things, or just trying to keep the peace, or make someone like me, but rather choosing it for their good. Um, I don't know that sounds kind of abstract, but for me that's like the, there's like a choosing. I'm actually in control of what I'm doing when I do it, as opposed to... So for many, I think it need, you need to have a boundary where you actually know you can say no before you say yes, before you allow this to happen. And so, yeah, I could go on and on, but... I think think too when we don't allow someone to treat us wrongly sometimes that can be a loving thing to do yeah and love and humility are not mutually exclusive and so sometimes the most loving thing to say is i you know it's i don't know i'm trying to think of a scenario where you are being abused and to say you know this is not okay and i'm going to step away from this conversation until we can come back because i want to have it with you but we need to be Respect, I want to respect you. I'd like you to respect me because that's the best way to move forward. And that's a that's a humble way of coming at it instead of saying, knock it off, you jerk. I mean, that's, you know, that's the opposite yeah. of the humble 
position, but it doesn't mean that you allow yeah. mm -hmm. an unhealthy environment. There's a way to do that in a loving and humble way. And it's tricky and it's really hard to do. Yeah. And I don't think, I know I don't do it well at all. I've been a Christian for 30 plus years to my shame. I still haven't allowed Jesus to help me do that. But we know Jesus dealt with conflict in a humble way and a loving way. And if anybody didn't need to be humble, it was him. And so yeah. it's it's a hard, it's a high bar. It's difficult. It's really difficult. But I don't think it has to be mutually exclusive. Yeah, having boundaries is different than being defensive. Yes, yes. That's what I'm trying to say. It's yes. A simple yeah. way of saying that. That's yeah. Good. Oh, I actually said something succinct. You did. <laughs> Mark that down. <laughs> Finding that balance is hard because, you know, in being humble, you have to be okay with being wronged and being okay with, you know, them not reciprocating that. But you also, like you said, you have to have some sense of boundaries on mm -hmm. what you'll allow. So it's it's a balance that you constantly have to evaluate and figure out yeah. where where is that line and what is crossing that line and what isn't. Yeah. Jeremy Vesley says, Peter said no to those who asked for money in Acts, but he loved and served in another way. So it's, it's okay to say no sometimes. Yes, it's it is okay point. to say that's, no. Yeah, that's wisdom. It's all yeah. got to work together. Yeah, and I think that's one thing that's um, maybe not like overlooked, but people think being Christ-like as a lot of times, like, you know, people will walk all over you all the time. But um, realizing that it is healthy and part of being Christ-like to say no and to have those boundaries like LaShawn was saying and what Becky was saying. Um, because if you're just, obviously, if you're letting people walk all over you, that's not very Christ-like in your own sense because then, yeah, people will just continue to take advantage of you. And uh, Yeah. Like if, if it is appropriate to say, to allow a person it, I think it's only healthy when it comes up when you when you you're good with your no. Mm -hmm. Like to to I, that's what I was trying to say in tons of words before was like <laughs> like somehow you have to be able to say no in order to give a good yes. You know? There's another area that's really um, dicey, and that's uh, like the whole arena of politics. Um, and I would love if we could just briefly touch a little bit on how does one maintain a posture of humility in such a divided, politicized world? Um, because we want to, we each and feel like entitled to have our, our voice uh, represent um, a certain party or a certain thought. In fact, you know, we each have a vote if you're a, a registered uh, voter. Like you put your vote in and that entitles your voice to be heard. So how do you think like we can best represent Christ when everything is politicized, when everything is um, taken in a way that people interpret what we say to represent a certain party or a certain ideology or in the middle of you know all the protests and, and the wrong happening in the world? Like, how do we maintain, like, a, a posture of humility and uh, represent Christ well? I thought your message, uh, it's funny that you asked, I didn't know you were going to ask that question. But as I was listening to your message, my mind kept going back to that. Because you, your whole arc of humility, anxiety, mm -hmm. and, and the connection between those, and then the minion at the end. Mm -hmm. That God's in control. I thought, like, um, control. You mentioned control. And the anxiety I see in so many Christians, um, or everybody, but Christians too. And it it seems like, um, you know, what he says, cast your, that, what you said about cast your anxieties, I thought that was really good. Because I, I guess I feel like I see a lot of believers instead of casting their anxieties on Jesus, they want to drag him into their anxieties and call it prayer. Yeah. You know, they want to say, I'm, and it's a, it's a, it, the way you talked about the circumstances and said, if, you know, if only this, and if only this, and if only, well, apply that to the world situation. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, if only COVID would go away, and if only my party would win, and if only, so mm -hmm. God, fix it. I'm anxious. Take my anxiety away by making things happen the way I think they need to happen. 
come into my anxiety and solve it by solving what I think is the problem instead of I cast it on you. You're in control regardless of what happens. I know you're in control and I'm at peace. You know, I, you know, whatever, not my will, but thine be done kind of thing. Yes, I'm concerned, but I give it to you. And so that's the picture I got in my mind as I was listening to your, to your message. Really hand it to him. So I walk away with peace regardless of how it all turns out. That's good. It's like a switching of priorities instead of saying, if everything works out in America the way I think it should, then the kingdom of God will be okay. Yeah. And switching that priority to, if the kingdom of God is alive in my heart and in our lives, then whatever happens in our country and around the world is like put in its proper place in submission to the kingdom of God. Yeah. I think there has to be a deep down, even myself, a deep down trust in God's sovereign will that he allowed Hitler, he allowed Nero, he has allowed far worse governments. If the gov if things here don't go as we want or things go from bad to worse, which ultimately we know they will because that's where the world is heading for Jesus to be able to come back. Things are going to go downhill, not uphill. Um, but to trust that he allows bad leaders and good leaders. I mean, look at the Bible and he works in spite. So there is no need for anxiety, no matter who wins the election ever. Really. If we truly believe that yeah. we vote and we just leave it in his hands because he's going to do what he's going to do. And it's okay. Quick answer also to your question. I thought everybody, uh, if you didn't see it on the North state Facebook, uh, what Melissa Dixon posted, I think is a good, that, that article is a good description of, I think, humility in conversation. I yeah. mean, because it talks about kindness, just the, the importance of the relational and humility and all that when it comes to changing people's minds and everything. So, so if you haven't read that piece, it's not written by a Christian, uh, but what he says is just kind of, frankly, it's just sort of practical wisdom, common sense. Yeah. Anything else you guys want to add? To I think it's just... Yeah, it's, it's important that we recognize that God is bigger than politics. And a lot of times people get so bogged down in their political views that they look at it as a moral authority. Like, I believe what's right and I'm going to demonize the other side because they're wrong. And you see it on both sides. Like, I'm not picking one or the other here. When in reality, Jesus didn't talk about politics a whole lot. He was much more concerned with spiritual reality and just that people were obedient to the law. And... So when we look at it that way, when you're trying to put down the other side of political argument and make them the enemy and make them the bad guy and demonize their view, we're completely omitting grace from the conversation and we're not focusing on the kingdom of God. Instead, we're focusing just on what we feel is right based on our opinion of it. And the other side would feel the same way. And so it's just, I don't know, politics are super contradictory in nature sometimes because everybody believes they're right and everybody believes the other is wrong. Yeah, and in reality, God is our ultimate truth, and so we have to trust that above everything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's good. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> um, I approve that message. I approve, <laughs> I approve that message. Um, so, Dave, can you give us a sixty-second uh, <laughs> timer? Day, I, don't know. I got a timer. timer. Uh, look at what we're jumping into oh, okay. over the next couple of weeks. Okay. Um, sneak preview. Yeah, sneak preview, yes. We are going to begin a new series. Uh, Caleb landed the plane on uh, Peter. So we are going to be looking at Galatians. Uh, <gasps> yay, Galatians. <laughs> That's <laughs> one of my favorite. Oh, one of her favorites. <laughs> so, uh, the book or the letter of Paul to the Galatians. We encourage you to read it. Uh, it's, it's an unusual letter. It's the only letter that has a lot of narrative in it. It has a lot of storytelling in it. So... Uh, read it, watch the Bible Project video on it. I'll put a link to that uh, on the on the Facebook page. Do your background stuff. Uh, at least read the first couple of chapters, but it's a short, it's five chapters. You can do it. Yeah. <laughs> read the whole thing, read it, read it, read it, read it over and over and over. Um, and we will launch into that next week. It's going to be a lot about freedom, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one of the themes of the book of Galatians is freedom yeah. in Christ. It's got to be good. Yeah. Okay, I think... We're probably good. Yeah. So okay, good. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us online. Obviously, we wished we could have met in person, 
Like I got out of the car when I was here at uh, the Montoya's house and I tasted ash in my mouth and we had ash kind of falling down on our car. And I thought, you know what, this is, it's a good thing. We pulled the plug and met online this morning, just, just so we're not complicating, you know, our, our health and our lungs and such. We want you guys to live long, <laughs> fruitful, fulfilled lives. And if we insist on, we're going to meet in the smoke, and every yeah. time we meet, we're yeah. knocking off a month of our very life. Um, so for Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, but yeah, thank you for meeting with us online. We are the community of God. Regardless of where we're meeting, we get to be church in our communities. Uh, again, it's not a building that we go to. It, church is people, and we get to be church to people this week. So I just encourage you to live the humility of Christ in your community, uh, wherever that is and whatever it looks like. Um, God's peace and grace be with you this week, and we will see you soon. Amen.